my name is Pete Pornichow. Been a radio personality in quotes for 40 years in New York City. Grew up in the Bronx, loving radio more than television because I always felt that television laid it out for you, put you know, forced you to take what they were putting out there, whereas radio in whatever form allowed you to use your imagination and make your own productions. The earliest record that I remember being impressed by was a, um, an album. You know, the, the, the term album was used to describe what happened when 78 RPM records were in fashion. They could only hold so much on one side of a disc. So that if you wanted to tell a longer story, you had to put some of it on side A, some of it on side B, disc two side A, disc two side B, disc three side A. One of those was called Rusty in Orchestraville. And it was the story of this little kid who hates doing his uh, piano lessons and he falls asleep and the leader of Orchestraville in his dreams takes him to meet every instrument in the orchestra. And I was just so impressed by that. Oddly enough, not impressed enough to ever learn an instrument. I do not play an instrument. However, there is absolutely, definitely some connection between that and my desire to embrace music as a career through playing it on the radio. You know, I was born in August, so by December, at four months, I'm sure I was hearing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or, um, you know, uh, uh, Mel Torme's Christmas song. So uh, I, I, I'm just guessing here, but I, I would think that holiday songs were one introduction to it. The radio station that my parents and uncles and aunts listened to was WNEW AM. They were the uh, station for the Great American Songbook. So very early on, I became acutely aware of and familiar with uh, Bing Crosby, certainly, but all of the Italian-American crooners, whether it was uh, Frank Sinatra or Perry Como or Tony Bennett or Vic Damone and Julius LaRosa, on and on and on and on and on. Uh, there, was, there was that element of Italian-American pride in this neighborhood in the Bronx, and it extended to sports. The Yankees were huge because they had so many Italian-American superstars. Joe DiMaggio and Yogi Berra and Frank Crosetti and Billy Martin and uh, Rocky Graziano was the heavyweight champion of the world. And I can distinctly remember that being a big source of, uh, of neighborhood pride. And certainly the mark made by all of those musicians that I mentioned earlier, Louis Prima, that was all part of my early consciousness about music on the radio. But then, <laughs> January 1956, I'm at home with my father, who's watching a show that was produced by Jackie Gleason, hosted by the, um, the Dorsey brothers. It was, uh, the, the program was called Stage Show, hosted by Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. And it was the first network television appearance of Elvis Presley. And my father calls me from the next room and says, you want to see the craziest man you'll ever see? And I went in and there was Elvis, shake, rattle, and roll, whatever he was playing. And my father was ridiculing it and outraged by it. And I loved it. I loved it. So, you know, now not only did I know that I wanted to somehow participate in radio, but now I knew I had something to play too, which was rock and roll. I mentioned earlier that uh, I grew up in the Bronx, two blocks away from Fordham University. The building that we are sitting in right now used to be the home of a 200-foot radio antenna that had one of those red blinking lights at the top for airplane safety or, or whatever the reasons were. And I could see that light blinking from, from where I lived, and I knew from grade school that one day I would go to that school and work for that radio station and that's literally exactly what came to pass over the next decade or so. 
my early influences for rock and roll radio were, of course, Alan Freed. He came to New York in 1954 and took it by storm. In addition to Alan Freed, some of the early influences included a guy named Bob Callan, who probably very few of our viewers are bound to recognize. He was an afternoon disc jockey on WMGM in New York. There was a time when there were four radio stations playing rock and roll on AM in New York. WABC, WMCA, WINS, and WMGM. And Bob Callan was the afternoon guy on WMGM in the summer of 1960. I was about 15 years old, didn't have working papers. My uncle hired me to paint the fire escape on our three-family apartment building. It was one of the hottest Julys that I could ever remember, and I'm out there scraping the old paint off, using a steel brush to get rid of the rust, painting with Rust-Oleum, and then finally whatever the last coat of paint was going to be. And the entire time, my companion is Bob Callan on the radio. And I'm sweating, and I ask my mother for a glass of lemonade or something, and I'm sitting there saying, I, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. <laughs> and I think that really is where the notion that I could make a life out of this came up. I never got to meet him. I never got to thank him. He's no longer with us, so this will have to suffice as uh, kudos to Bob Callan. Well, it was all AM back then. FM was the bastard stepchild of, uh, of AM radio. Uh, you know, the, 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 the history of FM is riddled with tragedy. The guy who invented it was sort of kept out of the box by the big guys and ultimately uh, ended up taking his own life. A man by the name of uh, Major Edwin Armstrong. But then in the uh, 50s and 60s, FM, which was sort of a backup service to the AM stations, uh, there was a, a revolution that was caused by, of all entities, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Strange bedfellows indeed. Because what they did was, in the post-war years, every point on the AM band was just jam-packed with radio stations. And in order to allow more people into the industry, the FCC said that if you were in a market of a certain size, simulcasting the same programming on AM as FM, you could no longer do that. You had to come up with an alternative service on the FM radio station. Well, the deadline for doing this was either uh, 1965 or 1966, and it really set the industry in a frenzy because they had to come up with new ideas for FM. One of those ideas was, let's try rock and roll. The first station to do it, other than the public stations or the college radio stations, the first station to do it in New York was WOR-FM. Uh, I'll never forget this. It was, uh, I think it was July 1st, 1966. You know, that was the station that used to have rambling with gambling on in the morning on both AM and FM. And on this particular Saturday morning at 6 AM, the new format began with Wild Thing by the Trogs. And I just imagined this elderly woman tuning in her FM radio to hear rambling with gambling and having a heart attack hearing the Trogs. Um, but that was really, it was still in its infancy. It took about, it took about an, a decade and a half for FM to climb from that low rung of the ladder to finally achieve parity with AM and then ultimately to surpass it in terms of its money-making abilities. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, true to that story I told you earlier, I came to this campus first in high school. That didn't count. That was from 59 to 63. But in 63, I arrived at Fordham University and made a beeline for the radio station. Uh, even then, radio is a very clicky business, you know. The station was in the hands of the upperclassmen, and to worm your way in was a difficult task, but I was determined to do so. So I cleaned ashtrays and filed records and did whatever I have to do. 
uh, caught the fancy of one of the upperclassmen who asked me to come in on a Wednesday night <laughs> and do the station identification before his classical music show on Wednesday night at 10 p.m. So, I think it was October 15th, 1963. I walked from my house two blocks away from here to WFUV at Fordham. Got nervous as all get out as the clock started ticking towards 10 o'clock. Did the ID. You know, this is WFUV, Fordham University's voice, 90.7 FM mega cycles on your radio dial. You actually had to say things like that in those days for legal purposes. Uh, stay tuned for symphonic encores with your host, Ed De Pasquale. That was it. I, you won't find those words in the uh, Museum of uh, Radio and Television, but in my own mind, oh my God, I was on the radio. And then I just built from that my four years here, uh, proposed a rock and roll show in 1964. We called it Campus Caravan. It went on the air in November of 64. And the Beatles had happened earlier that year, so the timing could not have been better. I didn't want to play little islands of hits in between commercials. This was a non-commercial station. So I used that freedom, A, to put sets of music together thematically, something that I obviously still do to this very day, uh, B, to play album cuts as well as whatever the hit singles from those albums were, and third, wherever possible, to interview the artists making the music. Again, I was fortunate because Fordham was a hotbed of concert activity. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel were here in 1966 and 67. I met and interviewed them both of those years. The Beach Boys, I first met the Beach Boys here. I met uh, Roger McGuinn and David Crosby of The Birds when Roger was still Jim McGuinn, not, not Roger McGuinn. That's been now a, a lifelong friendship. Uh, Richie Havens, Buffy St. Marie, the Chambers Brothers, uh, and on and on and on. So it was a really good play. Mamas and Papas, <laughs> Love and Spoonful. Uh, it was a really great place to, uh, to, to, to learn the craft and bring to it, you know, my own ideas of uh, how music could be presented. You know, I have to say, you got to have some talent, you got to have determination, but more than anything else, you got to have luck and you got to be in the right place at the right time. And that's my story. Um, in, in 1967, a DJ named Roscoe, real name Bill Mercer, but Roscoe was one of the anchors of uh, WORFM, whom I mentioned earlier as the first rock and roll FM station. Well, they were on the air about a year. And the owners saw that they could make money off of this music. So they brought in a consultant from California to transform this, this free-form, gadabout radio station into a streamlined uh, top 40 on FM. And Roscoe quit on the air. He resigned on the radio. The show was on from 10 p.m. to 2 in the morning. I, w I missed it for whatever reason that night, but heard about it the next day in the newspaper or whatever. And I was still doing my show here at, uh, at Fordham. I invited him up the following Saturday to explain the reasons why he had quit on the air. Unbeknownst to him and me, the general manager of WNEW-FM was listening to see how he would handle himself in this delicate situation. Well. He heard Roscoe, but he also heard this kid talking to Roscoe. What I didn't know, what he didn't know, was that NEW's response to the FCC decision was to put all women on the FM radio station playing the same music that the men on AM were playing. Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, etc., etc., etc. It didn't work. The world was not ready for women disc jockeys in 1965 or 66 when this happened. So after hearing that broadcast, the general manager hired Roscoe to anchor this new format, the new groove at 102.7 WNEW-FM. And they built the station around him. The only holdover from the staff of women DJs 
was a woman named Alison Steele who reinvented herself as the Nightbird and became probably one of the pioneer women broadcasters in the country. I think Allison broke down the doors for all of those who followed her through and have gainful employment in radio uh, ever since. So they built the station one disc jockey at a time. It was, uh, it was uh, Roscoe first, then it was Allison Steele the Nightbird, Jonathan Schwartz from Boston, Scott Muni, who had made the transition from Top 40 to FM radio at WOR-FM. And um, I got a call for an audition on Columbus Day in 1967. And I was at the time teaching high school on Long Island to avoid the draft. And I'll never forget it. They put me in a production studio next to Ted Brown, a legendary AM disc jockey who was working through the glass right next to me. And I was so intimidated, I spoke even an octave higher than I already do. I played records at the wrong speed. It was a disaster. And about a week later, I got a letter from the program director who said, you're a fine young man. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And I took it to mean, don't call us, we'll call you. And was very disappointed and discouraged. Went back to teaching and, and my might have continued teaching to this day had not one of the lucky circumstances that I referred to earlier happened in 1969. Someone was sick, someone had been let go, and someone was on vacation, and they needed a warm body to fill the graveyard shift on the weekend. Graveyard shift is midnight to six in the morning. And I got the call. Roscoe remembered me, suggested me to the program director, who also said, ah, let's give him a shot. And I did two overnights, uh, the, uh, a weekend in July of 1969. First live commercial that I ever did on the radio at WNEW FM was for the Woodstock Music and Art Fair, which became the subject of another book that I did many years, uh, many years later. But, you know, I, I, I had made my mark. They, they liked it. They kept me on as the fill-in guy, the part-time guy. Then they gave me a couple of regular weekend shows. Then they gave me the morning show. I did 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. for a year. And uh, to this day, I will tell you that it ruins your life. When that alarm rings at 4 a.m., that's the last thing you want to hear, let me tell you. Uh, but after a year, they moved me to 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and that's pretty much where a lot of people remember me from because I did it for about a dozen years about a dozen. Radio went through very many changes in those, uh, in those years. I was spoiled silly. From my first day here up to that point, I had always programmed my own shows. I had always picked the tunes. That's what I enjoy more than anything else, picking the music and putting it together in some creative fashion. When that responsibility was taken out of my hands, it was disastrous. I mean, I really felt like uh, I, I, when that was going on, I would get off the air at 2 o'clock. If I got the first train out of Penn Station, I'd be home at 3 and I went to bed. It was that depressing. And then I just said, you know, enough of this. Let me do what I do best. And I made this deal with them that I would give up the midday show and do two specialty shows on the weekend. One was called Saturday Morning 60s on Saturday, which was the essence of what the station had been built upon. And the other one was called Mixed Bag on Sunday mornings at, at, at that time. And that's the one that's running to this very day, 29 years later. So go figure. <laughs>